sustain or disregard the last question. Dr. Swanner, we have never spoken before today, correct? That's correct. Have you spoken to Mr. Zion before today? Yes. Okay. Now, I want to go back to um, the incident, well, the meeting that you had with Dr. Hughes and Dr. Ralston on um, November 26th of 2018. Do you recall that line of question? <laughs> yes. Now, when I asked you whether you had actually, whether you actually patted Dr. Hughes on the back and told him not to worry, that he wasn't going to lose his job. You're not denying it happened. You're just saying you don't recall, correct? No, I'm denying that it happened. Okay. Now, having said that, sir, is it in a fact that Dr. Hussle's privileges were renewed at Mount Carmel two days after that meeting on November 28, 2018? Uh, I don't remember the exact date, but approximately, yes. Okay. And that was after having this discussion with Dr. Hewesel and Dr. Alston about this potential uh, committee to create the order set, correct? Yes. Yes. Now, in fact, he utilized you and Dr. Alston as references to get his privileges renewed, did he not? I don't recall that. Okay. Um, you're not disputing it, it's just something you don't recall, is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Um, now, sir, I want to go back to the line of questioning that you had with Mr. Zion in reference to the reports that were run <laughs> according to you, after this meeting with Dr. Husel, Do you recall that line of questioning? Yes, but I didn't say they were run after the meeting with Dr. Husel. I was just made aware of them after the meeting with Dr. Husel. Okay. And these were reports created by Leslie Bowman, correct? I believe so, yes. Sir, you were asked under direct examination by Mr. Zion. I believe there was a moment where he specifically asked you, came over here and said, how many doctors are doing this? Do you recall that question? I'm sorry, I didn't hear what you said. Sure. I said that there was a question asked to you about these reports and Mr. Zion specifically said, how many doctors are doing this? Do you remember that moment in court, sir? Yes, I do. Okay. Now, isn't it a fact, sir, that these reports were run by Leslie Bowman on November 23rd, 26th, December 5th, December 19th, and the 21st. Do you see? Am I, am I correct in those dates? I know that these reports were rerun with different parameters several times. And that's what I want to talk to you about, sir. I afforded uh, your lawyer a, now this is specifically uh, labeled as Project Lighthouse, right? These reports? I believe so. And they were part yes, of this probably. whole project by both Mount Carmel and Trinity. Right? Yes. Now, I forwarded your lawyer, in case you need to refresh your recollection on dates, but isn't it a fact, sir, that the report parameters were expired patients within 40, 400 minutes from order by Dr. William Husel, MD? Correct? Um, I don't know. I haven't seen those reports yet. Why don't you take a look at, if you, do you think it might refresh your recollection if you look at the table of contents of all of the reports that were run? It may, I did not see all of the reports. Okay. My what testimony if, was only re I want to refer to the one where you testified to this jury that the only doctor 
or how many doctors are doing this? It was just Dr. Husel. Take a look okay. at the table of contents. when you're done. <clears throat> and for the purpose of my question, doctor, all I need you to do is look at the table of contents. Okay. Isn't it a fact, sir, that the parameters for the search and the only doctor looked at was Dr. William Husel, correct? Correct with this report only. All five of the reports that, that are listed in that table of contents under Project Lighthouse, the parameters are set to only bring up Dr. William Husel, correct? For these reports, yes. And it is also, sir, the only, well, just so we're clear, this is the report that, that, uh, that Mr. Zion was referring to you, correct? Referring no. you to, correct? No. Now there's another report from Project Lighthouse. Is that your testimony, sir? I remember seeing a different report. Okay. Um, and when exactly was that report done, sir? If you're so confident, it's another report. What was it? I'm sorry, I didn't hear your question again. Well, let me let me strike that and ask you, this. <laughs> sir. The first report written, done for Project Lighthouse had to deal with expired patients where that within 400 minutes from order by Dr. William Husel, correct? The first report in this that you gave me, that is correct for that. The second report done on the date you had the meeting was expired patients within 400 minutes from order by Dr. Husel, correct? Yes. The third report, expired patient, ordered by Dr. William Husel. 400 minutes was taken out, correct? Yes. Third report, expired patients with order by Dr. William Husel, correct? Yes. And that date was on the 19th of December, 2018, correct? Yes. And that was after you had already gone to law enforcement, right? What was that date again? December 19, 2018. Yes. And the That's other correct. report, the one I mentioned prior, was on December 5th, 2018, the day you reached out to law enforcement, correct? Yes. So, sir, as we went through the, the timeline of events in your direct and your cross-examination, these are the reports that you had access to as the Vice President of Medical Affairs that were run on Dr. William Husel, correct? And Dr. William Husel. Uh, I, I would not say I had access to all of these. I don't remember seeing these prior to today. Now, sir, you also, uh, the parameters of this report also only refer to expired patients, do they not? That's correct. And that is patients who have passed away, correct? Yes. And then there was a fifth report run on December 21st, 2018, correct? That will be at the bottom of the page, sir. Yes. And this also has to deal only with expired patients, correct? 
Yes. Yes. And the only doctor looked at in this report is Dr. William Houston, correct? Yes. Sir, the reports that you um, that you looked at for a project lighthouse as it related to the searches of 500 mics of fentanyl and above also included that of a patient named Tracy Young. Is it not correct? I don't recall that name. Let me ask you this. Are you saying you don't recall that name at all until today? Or you don't recall that name back then? I don't recall that name back then. I heard that name for the first time approximately one week ago. So it wasn't until a week ago that the name Tracy Young was brought to your attention after you had already been fired from Mount Carmel? And after, that's true. And okay, after getting compound question. I'm sorry, I, I, I was caught myself, Judge. And that's after you had reported Dr. Husel to the police? Yes. And after Dr. Husel was charged with 14 counts of murder, right? I, yes. Okay. Now, sir, you're aware that the report on December 5th, when the parameter was taken out of the 400 minutes. Okay, uh, let me back. I'm let, going to let me back. Let me back. Uh, okay, hold on. Stop. We got an objection going. Is this a sidebar? Well, I don't think so. Dr. Swanner said, I, I'm not familiar with those reports. I'm not familiar with the parameters. I don't think it's fair to further question them. Okay, let's go sidebar. Ladies and gentlemen.
Sam, are you? Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to continue on with the testimony. Sometimes we have to do this judge stuff. Okay, you just got to have some patience with me. Okay? With that, you may proceed. Thank you, Judge. Uh, Dr. Ralston, just so we're clear, I'm referring to only the reports created by Leslie Bowman, okay, for the purpose of my questions. Just for clarification, I'm Dr. Swanner, um, and I understand what you're referring to. All right. Uh, so, Dr. Swanner, what did I call you? Dr. Ross. You called me Dr. Ralston. All right, Dr. Swanner. Dr. Swanner, um, I'm specifically referring to the reports created by Leslie Bowman, okay? Okay. And those were the questions asked to you by uh, Mr. Zion in reference to that report that we were discussing, that you discussed during your direct, okay? By Leslie okay. Bowman. Now, having said that, 
if the parameters for the December 5th report was expired patients ordered by Dr. Husel to, pay, to patients discharge date and time for 500 mics of fentanyl or greater IV push. So those are the parameters of that search. You understand? Yes. If in fact, a patient by the name of Tracy Young received 2,500 micrograms of fentanyl and- uh, Let's finish the question. And went on to live another nine days after the fentanyl had left her system. Would that have shown up in that report under those okay. parameters? Sustained, rephrase. Disregard the question, ladies and sure. gentlemen. Sure. If in fact a, a dose of 2,500 micrograms came up, was in the Mount Carmel Medical Record System, that would have shown up on that report, correct? I believe so. Okay. And that was December 5th, 2018, right? That report date? Yes. And that's the, yes. same, that's the same date that Mount Carmel took this case to the state attorney's office in order to prosecute Dr. Husel, right? Yes. Now, sir, you mentioned in your direct examination about Trinity Health being the parent company of Mount Carmel. Do you recall that testimony? Yes. Now, Trinity Health is in charge of 88 different hospitals across the country. Isn't that correct? Uh, that could be. I don't remember the actual number. And this is a $20 billion corporation, is it not? Yes. Having said that, sir, at this point, you, you mentioned that at some point there was an external peer review. Do you recall that testimony? Yes. Um, there at one, there at a specific time was a review done by someone external to Mount Car Carmel by the name of Dr. Toka Bradley. Do you recall that? Yes. And Ms. Toka Bradley, when she conducted this review, of some of the patients as you described. <laughs> uh, let me strike that. Ms. Toka Bradley reviewed, her initial review was that of five patients, right? I don't recall the specific number. Okay, but you know it was a handful of cases, right? That's correct. You also know that she didn't have access to the medical Objection, records, right? Your Honor, as to what time Objection, you were sustained. Well, as far as you're concerned in, in relation to that review, or as far as you're aware, you're aware, sir, that, sh that Dr. Toka Bradley did not have Objection, access to medical records. Objection, Dr. Bradley had access to or what her knowledge was. Okay, if he's aware. Okay. I, I can't understand the objection when you're Okay, Mr. Zion. As he, it's a speculation as to what she may know, okay? And I sustained it. You two-parted it. Can I ask him if he's aware? Dr. Swanner, are you aware that Dr. Toka Bradley did not have access to the medical records when doing this review? Objection. No. I make the question. So you're not aware? You just testified to that. I'm, I'm going I'm, I'm transitioning, Judge. So you're not, this was done just a couple of days before going to the police, correct? I was informed of it on the 4th of December. I'm not sure when it was actually done. Okay. Uh, now, sir, you mentioned that Sub, that you were part of that meeting with the prosecutors? The very first meeting? Yes. And you yes. mentioned that you were present? I think he's 
jumped in there in the middle of your thing. What did you say, doctor? I said, uh, what did I say regarding what, Judge? You said yes, and then you said something else. That you were present at the meeting. Didn't you say something else? Oh. No, I just said yes. Okay. You mentioned in your direct testimony that Sean McGibbon was there, correct? That's correct. And that's another Mount Carmel uh, administrator. That's correct. And you said, I believe the general counsel was there as well. You recall saying that? Yes. You didn't mention that there was a criminal defense lawyer present, right? That's correct. And this criminal defense lawyer represented Mount Carmel, is he not? Yes. And this criminal defense lawyer was retained to set up the meeting, was he not? Objection as to why the criminal defense counsel was retained. If he knows. Do you I was know why he told was that he arranged. Okay. I was told he, he arranged the meeting. Were you aware that he worked for that office for 14 years? At some point I was made aware of that. Okay. I don't remember if I knew that at the time of the meeting or later. Was there one criminal defense lawyer at this meeting or two? I only recall the one. Okay, and would that be Mr. Greg Peterson? Yes. And Mr. Peterson became the liaison between Mount Carmel and the prosecutor's office, right? I believe so, yes. And then at that point, there was a project or an operation, I guess, is the best I could describe, called Project Lighthouse. Are you aware of that operation, sir? You asked him that a bit ago. I have I've asked him about the reports. Okay. Go ahead. I was, I was aware of the name Project Lighthouse that was assigned to everything to do with these cases and the issues around them. It wasn't necessarily an operation or a project. It was this particular set of issues. Well, as it was explained to me. Sir, as a hospital administrator, you're aware that sometimes operations are given titles like the one of Project Lighthouse so that certain documents could be kept confidential within the attorney client privilege? Right? Yes. Okay. Yes. And Project Lighthouse was one of such one of those such operations, was it not? Yes. Now, sir, as part of Project Lighthouse, Trinity had employed a crisis management group by the name of Jared. Did it not? What was the name again? Jared. Does that name sound familiar to you? It does not. You testified under direct examination that you had external, try to look at the, the way you described it, external consultants. Yes. And this was in the area of communications, was it not? Yes. And these external experts created a thing called a playbook in terms of what the message would be to the media. Did it not? I believe so. And in there, as you described in your direct examination, you said you attended several meetings as to what should be communicated and how they should be communicated. Did you not? Yes. And one of those ways of how things should be communicated, there were discussions and topics that were passed around amongst the executives or higher, I'm sorry, high level executives as to what the message should be, right? Yes. 
And that message, sir, was who would be the villain, who would be the victim, and who would be the vindicator. Do you recall that, sir? I recall hearing about that. Okay. And the villain was to be, it was decided that the villain was to be Dr. William Husel, as well as the nurses and pharmacists, excluding the ones who were, who, excluding the pharmacists who reported the incident and excluding the nurses who had preceptors. Isn't that a fact, sir? I don't recall those details. You do recall, sir, the detail of making Dr. William Husel a villain in the media, do you not? I recall the decisions made that when identifying what the issues were that Dr. Husel had prescribed that, excess doses the of these medications. Objection, Your Honor. He should be allowed to answer the question. Let him finish process. his answer. Really called for a yes or no. No, it didn't, but go ahead, doctor, finish your answer. I recall the message being that Dr. Husel had ordered and prescribed excessive doses of these medications that may have led to premature death of certain patients. I don't recall anyone saying to me, we are identifying him as a villain per se. Sir, I, I, I sent to your attorney an attachment Call, uh, with defendant's exhibit MCD6. I would ask him to hand that to you right now. It's a document titled High Level Questions for Decisions and the version is December 18, 2018 at 5.30 p.m. Can you please retrieve that, sir? You see the doc. We're looking for it. These were not. These were not stamped. Can you provide a more descriptive summary of the document? Um, the question is, can there be a more descriptive summary of the document? Sure. I, if I can have a moment. I'm taking a look. Doc, have some patience. Okay. These were not pre-stamped. The, the version you stated. Sign any objection? I do object, Your Honor. It's not his. I'd like for you to review the document. I'm sorry? Review the document so we can see if it helps you for whatever purpose here. Okay. Sure. Um, 
Sir, uh, is that, you looked it over, you understand it? Yes, I understand it. Okay. Now, sir. Okay, well, you still got a foundation I, I'm about to ask. Sir, does that refresh your recollection as to who was to be made the bill? Objection, Your Honor. Indicator? Sustained. Does that refresh your recollection, sir? Sustained. Can we approach this? Yeah. I'm a little lost on what you Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. <laughs>
you, Sam. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Mr. Baez. Thank you. Dr. Swanner, uh, after having reviewed yes. that document, do you, does that refresh your recollection as to who is to be made the victim, villain, and vindicator? Well, it vaguely refreshes my memory because I vaguely now remember some conversations about this. Um, and as it says on the front, that, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. You were saying? Um, on the front, it does in, in uh, quotes indicate the villain and several choices of who that should be identified as. Did you ever? I'm not sure if. Okay, we're good. Sure. Next question. Did you ever, sir, confront the communications people and say, this is wrong. I will not participate in making someone a villain. No, because that particular communications consultant, I think, was replaced by someone else before this became active. Okay. Uh, let me ask you this, sir. Eventually, you were asked to participate in making some videos. Do you recall that? Yes. And these were videos that were to be distributed to both internal employees as well as to the public in Columbus, Ohio, correct? Yes. And part of this playbook, these videos were part of this playbook, was it not? I don't remember that. Okay. Now, you didn't write or, or direct these videos, correct? That's correct. Okay. Um, I am, I'd like to draw your attention to defendant's exhibit MCD8. Can you take a look at that? <coughs> Okay. Yeah, could you describe the title of the document sure. that we have evidently are not labeled? Sure. Uh, it's attachment three of the email I sent. It, the, the document title is external, mes the external messaging uh, version, December 18, 2018, 1048 p.m. Eastern Standard. Okay. Actually, that's not the one I wanted to draw your attention to. I'm, I apologize, sir. I'm referring to number five, attachment five, external version of December 27, 2018, 5.15 p.m. Do you see that, sir? Okay. Yes. For the record is MCD 10. Now, yes. you recognize this as a Mount Carmel document? Yes. And you also recognize this as the, I guess, the script that was given to you and Mr. Lamb, the president of Mount Carmel. Is that correct? Yes. And yes. this, in fact, is a script that you read and created a video for, correct? That's correct. Judge, I'd like to publish it. Let me get a cleaner version. Oh, go ahead. So this one. I'm sorry. Okay. Now, before we bring that up, let me ask you this. You didn't, you didn't write this? No. And um, you, mes you mentioned during direct examination that uh, you got media training from this consult from A little these bit. consultants. A little bit, yes. Okay. And but this was more of a acting job, right? Yes. And you had to read a script from a teleprompter? Not until I did this. <laughs> yeah, this is the first time you've ever had to read from a teleprompter, right? That's correct. I notice you have a background in pharmacy. You don't have one in acting, do you? Uh no. Okay. And on this script, I'd like to go ahead and show it to you. I'd like to draw your
your attention to this portion right here, where it says, I'm sorry, the during the five years he worked here, this former employee ordered fatal doses of pain medication. Do you see that? You can take it down. Yes. Okay, go ahead. Take that down. Now, sir, this was the message on 12-27-18 that you read on behalf of Mount Carmel with also the president, um, Mr. Ed Lamb, correct? That's correct. Now, you mentioned um, Katie Barga had brought this, these complaints originally to your attention, and she is the patient safety risk officer, right? That's correct. And she was in charge of the internal investigation for the root cause analysis, correct? Yes. And that was started, um, well, I should say, that was completed on the 5th of January, correct? Uh, I'm not sure. Okay. Um, I'll get the time. Give me a second, I'll find. Does that date sound about right? It sounds about right, yes. Okay. Subsequent, aside from doing many takes of these videos, you added to a few, you didn't get it the first time, right? I'm sorry, I have a hard time hearing you when you move away. Sure, um, aside, from the from, aside from doing several takes uh, of this video, you had to do several takes, you didn't get it right the first time, right? That's correct. Um, you also had multiple versions or different videos that you made, right? Uh, I did make more than one video. Right, that was my question. Sir, the, after the root cause analysis was done on January 5th, you did a new video on the 12th. Is that correct? I don't remember the dates. That could be correct. Okay. I'd like to draw your attention to uh, attachment four, and that's for the record, defendant's exhibit MCD9. And it says external mes messaging, important for, st for statement, version January 12, 2019, 12.30 p.m. Okay. Sir, you recognize this as a Mount Carmel document? Yes, I do. Okay, and this was in fact the script you were given to read? Uh, I believe, yes. And do you have any? Which one is this one? MCD9. I don't see 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 MCD9. Are you referring to the Bates number? I don't have that. You guys can get us labeled stuff. The one dated 112 19. Okay, we've got several dated 112 19. Is this the one you're referring to? At 12.30 p.m. Eastern time? Email? Yeah. Right. Where's the script? Oh, it's down yeah, here. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, may I pull this, Judge? I don't believe you have No objection. Now, sir. After the root cause, we already talked about your first, um, I want to bring you into the timeline of events here. We, we show, I showed you previously the one you did in December, the, the video you made in December. You recall that, right? Yes. Okay, and then um, you don't have an issue with the January 5th being the date that the root cause analysis was complete, correct? That's correct. Okay. And then this version was subsequent to that, which would be January 12, 2019, right? Yes. Okay. I'd like to draw your attention to the end of paragraph two, where it says, it is possible the extra medication wrongly shortened many of their lives. Do you see that?
The very last sentence. Hold on one second. Sure. Oh, okay. I thought you were talking about the script. Yeah, we're going to get to Sorry. that in a minute. But do you see that there? Yes. Okay. That was the message sent out to the media, correct? Yes. Okay, let's go to the next page. Now let's go look at the script. I want to direct your attention now to scroll up, please. Keep going down. Down, down I guess. Down. <laughs> Keep going. Down. Just bring that whole page up. This the next page. All right. Now, <clears throat> you know, I'm sorry. Go back to the next page. I want this part here. Uh, more down. Keep going down. I want to talk, I want to, I want to basically look at here and draw your attention to where there's numerous edits here. See where failed to report the excessive doses in a timely manner as they were required to do so was taken out? Yes. And then the next paragraph where it says it's possible the extra medication shortened many or shortened some of their lives. Do you see that? Yes. The word likely is scratched out, correct? Yes. And the word many is also scratched out, correct? Yes. And then go back down to this section here. It's coming. Scroll down. It's coming. Yeah. The very last sentence on this page here. The doses often is scratched out and says potentially fatal, right? Yes. I can take it down. So in December, your message to the public, sir, as directed by Mount Carmel, were that these were fatal doses. Remember reading that from the script? Yes. Yes. And then after the root cause analysis comes out, it's now possible that the extra medication wrongly shortened many of their lives. You read that, correct? Correct. And instead of potential, often, these doses were often, but then it was changed to these doses were potentially fatal, correct? Yes. Now, you were still meeting with law enforcement and the prosecutor's office when you made this video, were you not? I don't recall if I was still personally meeting. I was not meeting with the prosecutor's office at that point. I don't recall if I was meeting with the detectives. Did you ever pick up the phone and call either the police or the prosecutors and tell them about the results of your root cause analysis? No. Did you ever pick up the phone and call the prosecutors or the police and tell them, we think that these doses were potentially fatal? No. Did you ever pick up the phone and tell the prosecutors or the police that it's possible these medications shorten their lives? No. Sir, some of the other discussions that were had, the internal discussions from Project Lighthouse and the playbook, also raised the question 
as to whether you should self-report to the Department of Justice. Isn't that correct? I'm sorry, someone coughed. I didn't hear what you said sorry, after. I, sorry, I want to look at you. It's kind of hard sideways. Some of the questions, or one of the questions raised during Project Lighthouse's playbook was that whether or not Mount Carmel should self-report to the Department of Justice. Isn't that a fact, sir? I don't remember those discussions. If I show you, well, like, if I show you a document, an internal document from Project Lighthouse revolving these questions or asking these questions, would that refresh your recollection? I'm happy to look at them. I don't know. Okay. I'd like to draw your attention to attachment eight, defendants, for the record, defendants exhibit MCD 13, and it's titled Privileged and Confidential Draft FAQs yeah, Updated 1229-18. That was enough. You directed them accordingly. Yes, sir. Okay. On page 10, if I can direct your attention no, to. No, 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 no. You asked if he could refresh his memory. If I'm just going to tell him where to look. That's it. Well, he has the right to look at the document to see if it refreshes his memory. Sir, as it relates to... Okay, hold on. Doctor, does that refresh your memory? No, I don't recall seeing this document ever before. Okay. In light of that, let me ask you this. Did you ever self-report to the Department of Justice that controlled substances were not... Well, that there was an issue with controlled substances at the pharmacy? Me personally? Yes, you. No. Were you ever part of any discussions with other executives at Mount Carmel surrounding the decision as to whether you should self-report to the Department of Justice? I don't recall any meetings where that was discussed. Sir, as a hospital administrator, you're aware that entities such as Mount Carmel have been held criminally liable for, by the Department of Justice for failure to control controlled substances? Are you not? Yes. Yes. And you're aware that this is a serious crime, is you, are, are you not? Okay. Yes. And you're also aware that you, as one of the executives, could also be held criminally liable. Objection. Sustained. Are you aware as to whether Mount, are you aware as to whether that was the reason Mount Carmel hired two criminal defense lawyers? No, it was not explained to me the rationale behind it. Now, sir, you talked about some of the external messages. Well, no, let me rephrase that. You talked about how um, in your direct examination, you talked about making phone calls to the family members. Do you remember that? Yes. And you were also given a script for those, uh, for those specific calls, were you not? 
Yes. Sir, you're aware that executives If I can have just a second, I want to make sure I get the right date. Right. Were you aware of a meeting on December 17th, 2018 with Trinity Health CCO, Mount Carmel's General Counsel, Criminal Defense Counsel, Vice President of Strategy and Planning, meeting with the prosecutors? No. Nobody told you about it? Not that I recall. Okay. And that, I, and I'm specifically referring December 17, 2018. Nope. I don't recall hearing about that. Okay. Is there any reason as an executive at, um, at Mount Carmel, why the vice president of strategy and planning would be meeting with the prosecutor? I'm not aware. The, I know the communications department reported to him, um, but I don't know why he was in attendance with, with the prosecutor. I don't know. Based on this case, um, based on this case and what you know about this case, the vice president of strategy and planning wouldn't be able to provide any. Okay, you're walking away from the mic. Wouldn't be able to provide any information to the prosecutors. Isn't that correct? Sustain. Now, sir, the very next day, I'd like to bring your attention to one of the scripts that you had to read to the family members, and that is attachment three for the record. MCD 8, the title of the document is External Messaging, gives the date 12-18-18, titled Outreach to Patient Families. Do you see that, sir? Yes, I do. Unless there's any objection. You recognize this as a Mount Carmel document? Yes, I do. You see it as one of the scripts that you were given to read to the family members? Uh, yes. Okay. This isn't actually a script as much as it's a guideline, I think. Well, keep looking. Okay. Let's relax. Okay. Let's then look at the doc. Okay. Okay. Uh, unless there's any objection, I'd like to publish. No, any objection? Okay. Let's go. Now, in this in this document, two dis two scenarios are discussed. Correct? Yes. And scenario number one is detective is the first point of contact in relation to the families being interviewed. Correct? Yes. And it lists here, the detectives will be the first point of contact, in this scenario, the detectives will be the first point of contact with the family as part of their investigation. And it says, the detective will use the talking points below regarding Mount Carmel. Do you see that? Yes. And will offer a card and a dedicated phone number that they can call. Do you see that? Yes. And then it lists the talking points for the detective, right? Yes. Okay. Um, the detectives work for Mount Carmel? As far as no. you know? I'm sorry? No. Okay. Let's scroll down. Keep going down. Let's go to scenario number two is Mount Carmel is the first point of contact because family is not part of the investigation. Do you see that? Yes. It lists that the family is not part of the investigation there, correct? 
Yes. If, in fact, Mount Carmel under scenario two is the first point of contact, correct? Yes. And in there, it lists all of the talking points by the initial outreach identified by you, correct? Um, they, they asked me to talk to and pick appropriate physicians from the medical staff to be involved with this messaging and to get their permission and agreement to, to work with us on that. So that's what my job was ahead of time. Okay, but you testified on direct, you made these calls, right? Yes. And in fact, it was determined that scenario two would be the way things played out, correct? Yes, I, uh, yes, okay. So Mount Carmel had the first opportunity to speak to the witnesses in these murder cases, correct? I don't think we had the first opportunity. I think the detectives may have, I, I was told that Columbus police had signed off on us calling these people. So for whatever that means. Let, let me, all right, so for whatever it means, sir, it ultimately resulted in Mount Carmel reaching out to the families one month before the detectives ever spoke to a single family member. Isn't that correct, sir? Objection as to what his knowledge is. Well, I, I, I would object to the speaking objection suggesting okay. answer. Both of you, stop. Overrule on the objection. Can you answer the question? Um, Do you remember what the question I don't was? know. I do know what the question is, but I don't know when the detectives had the opportunity or did go speak to the families. So I don't know if this was before that or what. Well, I know you can't testify as to what the detectives did, so let me ask it this way. You reported this to the police December 5th, 2018, correct? That's correct. December 7th, detectives were talking to Mount Carmel employees, correct? That's correct. Employees you never spoke to during your investigation, correct? That's correct. And you didn't start making these calls until after Christmas, which is specifically December 27th, 2018, correct? Correct, I believe. I don't remember the exact date, but that sounds about right. And given those dates, it stands to reason, sir, that the detectives had the opportunity to speak with them from December 5th all the way until December 27th, but did not, correct? Objection once again. He knows, he knows he was the first. Okay, I'll over. permit the answer. Do you know the answer? Could you repeat the question again, please? December 5th, you guys go to the police, right? Yes. December 27th, you start notifying the families, right? Correct. They're already interviewing people on the 7th, correct? Yes. So they could have interviewed these family members and these witnesses all throughout that month of December, couldn't they have? Yes. But as far as you know, because that, well, let me rephrase that, but as far as you know, they did not. That's correct. And this is after meetings with you, criminal defense counsel, and the prosecutors, right? Yes. As well as a meeting with the vice president of strategy and planning from Mount Carmel, correct? Yes. Now, sir, I'm just about wrapping up. Now, you testified on direct examination that Mount Carmel wanted to be transparent, right? Yes. You never told any media members about these conversations about making Dr. Hussle a villain, did you, sir? Okay. No, I, I never did speak to the media myself. 
Okay. Um, now, sir, you also weren't allowed to tell them who the doctor was, correct? That's correct. And you also weren't allowed to give them uh, any more information that was listed in your script, correct? That's correct. And in fact, there was a plan laid out in the event that the families wanted to meet with members of the hospital, correct? Yes. And in fact, there was a separate plan if the meetings, if any of the patient's families showed up with lawyers. Isn't that correct? I believe there was. Okay. So Mount Carmel and their playbook anticipated that patients would probably get lawyers, right? I think they anticipated that that was a possibility. If I could have just one moment, Judge, I want to see if I have anything else. talking about the transparency with uh, the families that you wanted, to, that Mount Carmel wanted to have. Do you remember that? Yes. You never, or Mount, as far as you're aware, Mount Carmel never disclosed the root cause analysis to the patient's families, did they? I don't believe so. Okay. And as far as you know, um, that well, I'll, I'll strike that question. Let me ask you this now. You said that you were placed on leave in Jan on January 25th. You were placed on administrative leave. Do you recall testifying about that? Yes. Yes. And you were told when you were placed on leave, sir, that, or let me rephrase that. It was your understanding that the reason you were being placed on leave was because Mount Carmel wanted to appear as if they were conducting a neutral investigation. Isn't that correct, sir? That's not the way it was presented to me. Give me a second, sir. I want to make sure I get something. <laughs> your understanding, sir, that they wanted to avoid the, uh, imp any impression that there was any lack of objectivity in the investigation. Isn't that correct? To be honest, I was not presented with anything that had to do with observation okay. or impressions. Sir, do you recall giving a deposition under oath in a matter dated September 9th, 2020, in a matter that involved Mount Carmel Health System and one of the families? Uh, yes. Okay, and at that time you, you had a, an attorney present representing you? Yes. And at that time you were under oath? Yes. Much closer in time to the incidents than today? Yes. Fair to say your memory would have been better at that time? Perhaps, yes. 
Okay. Do you remember, sir, stating, I was told that several people, as I said, executives and leaders, were being placed on leave while this investigation occurred so that it would avoid any impression that there was a lack of objectivity in the investigation. Do you recall making that statement, sir? Yes, I do. Now, sir, you were then fired on September 11, 2019, right? No, I was terminated on July 11. I'm sorry, July 11, 2019. You were fired, right? Yes, yes. And no one came and spoke to you. Well, let me rephrase that. And you weren't given a reason as to why you were fired, right? That's correct. And no one came and spoke to you at any time between January and July to, get, to allow you to give your version of why you should still be employed, right? That's correct. Just like they did with Dr. Husel, right? No, I believe there was a difference. Okay. The difference is you spoke to Dr. Husel, correct? I that's did. The only, that's the only, I'm sorry, I, I interrupted you. You said yes? Yes, I did. Okay. And, and that was, of course, two days before his privileges were renewed, right? Okay, that's an answer. Let's move on. Now, sir, subsequent to being fired, you were fired by Ed Lamb, right? Yes. And the three people above you, well, subsequent to you being fired, you tried to obtain new employment, did you not? I actually, um, I did, yes. And you asked the three people who you worked for above you at Mount Carmel to endorse you on LinkedIn, did you not? That's correct. And they gave you glowing recommendations, didn't they? Yes, they did. Despite the fact that they fired you. Yes. And subsequent to all of that, you have now retired. Isn't that correct, sir? That is correct. And you blame Dr. Husel for being forced into retirement, don't you, sir? I blame several factors, being terminated, COVID, my age. I think what occurred around Dr. Husel and his behavior also contributed to that. So, sir, they knew your age when they fired you? Pardon me? They knew, uh, Mount Carmel knew your age when they fired you? Yes. Okay. And... Have you, is, have you initiated a lawsuit for age discrimination against Mount Carmel? Sustained. You eventually negotiated a settlement agreement, did you not? Sustained. No further questions. Okay, we'll go into recess. Ladies and gentlemen, have a wonderful break, 15 minutes. We'll get started back. I didn't think you could do it in three minutes. You asked all right. more time. Okay, do you need more time than 15 minutes? 15 minutes will be fine. I appreciate the timing, okay. Judge. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, have a great break.
guys, I'm sorry, do you have your exhibits up there? I, I, I meant to ask you to leave those up there. Uh, what is this again? All of them, please. Yeah. All the ones that you showed me this or referred to. That's when you get 14 boxes of crap. <laughs> Just the ones you showed me. Don't ask you, Major, you what you asked for. Words matter. Yeah. about 600 cases on our docket. We're one of the, we're the busiest state, we're the busiest court in the state for what we do. Cleveland has the same number of cases, but they have 36 judges, we have 17. So we're generally busy, and it involved another murder trial that you'll see my ugly face this, later this summer on, but that's beside the point. So we had to deal with something. So I apologize for the delay. Mr. Zion, are you ready to, we, doctor, you're still under oath? I'm here. Mr. Zion. Thank you. Doctor, I'd like to start my redirect where Mr. Baez started his cross-examination. Did you receive a subpoena to testify in this matter? Yes, I did. At some point, did you communicate health problems you were having? Yes, I did. Do you feel comfortable in general terms talking about those health problems and how they might affect your ability to testify? Yes. Do you recall the parties? Objection. 
Are you willing to stipulate what this, what you guys agreed to? Yes, if, if it's complete and accurate, absolutely. Do you recall the parties responding, what would be, out of these three options, the best? I'll permit the question so far. He was not present during okay. the conversation. Let's do it this way. Doctor, did you give us three options about testifying? Yes, I did. Okay. And that was relayed to who? The state? To the defense? No, that was relayed to my attorney. Okay. And you don't know what your attorney did after that? He contacted, he told me he contacted the concerned parties in the court. I'm not sure if that was okay, prosecution and defense. Well, you're speculating now. Help me out here, okay? So, okay. but these you were bet. your preferred conditions on testifying. These conditions today? Well, of the three, this was more comfortable yes. for you because of your injuries and needing to stretch out and various other reasons. That's correct. Okay. Thank you, Your Honor. Do you have a, a sick room there that you can go lie down on on the breaks? Objection, Judge. I think the court cleared this up. I'll permit it. There is a conference room next door uh, that is accommodating me by having uh, space and um, a table available for me to lay on to stretch out my back when necessary. All right. And are you scheduled or do you have a potential surgery coming up for that injury? I've been through a lot of conservative treatments that have not really helped. I'm scheduled to see my orthopedic surgeon this Friday, at which point I am anticipating we will schedule surgery. Is your appearance here today via video link in any way concerned with Mr. Baez's cross-examination of you? He asked that directly. He did. I'll permit it. No. All right. Let's get to the meat of this. Objection, Judge. Let's ask the narrative, ladies and gentlemen, you disregard the narrative. Recall 20F is what we've called it. Do you have that email from November 19th in front of you? I don't have it up on the screen. Um, I can put it up on this if you want. I have to look for it. I've had a lot of documents laid in front of me today. Let me find it. Email from 1219. 1119 or 1219? 1119. November 19th. I don't think we ever received a copy of that. All right. It was shown to you uh, uh, by both parties, Mr. Bias talked about what Dina says on that. Could I use this, Judge, to show him? Any objection? No objection. You'll go blank for a second. Uh, looking at 20F, what Dina said on that. If you could transfer it over, Judge. It's already there. No, you got to, like, blank him out and go to the overhead. That's not how I was explaining to me, David. Do you know? Paul was over there having secretive secrets. <laughs> Black it out. We'll run it again. Um, I don't know how to use. <laughs> You're assuming that it's going to work. This pad up here is, excuse the expression, stunk the whole trial. <laughs> David, you may have to hit cart front location and two all because it's not reacting to me at all. On the pad should be presentation. Video conference, cart front, to all. And those are all highlighted. Okay, right. hit black out. Black all. Black all, and then go back to cart front. And to all. Seems like a Paul moment here. <laughs> Okay. We can't get a judge and I'll, and I'll, let me do something with the jury here real quick. Government things, we're probably one of the best technology courtrooms in the United States, okay? Um, this was from our preceding vendor. It was their solution to upgrading life. 
and it's not been the most conducive. We actually went to a different vendor, okay? But they haven't had time to remove this. I'll leave it at that as this, okay? So we're bearing with it. So we're going to get Paul. We can we can move on, Judge. I think why we've got don't you a do something else, and we can come back to it if you wish. I yeah, just, we agreed on something, so okay. We can move forward. Okay, so we'll take off. Doc, are you there? I'm here. All right. So by stipulation of the parties, 20F, the part referring to Dina, the part that Mr. Baez, you agree you showed him that? By stipulation, it says, see back up? <coughs> <laughs> to try to put the dock up on the screen it hit private and wouldn't adjust i totally get out of the picture because this one's been the problem up here david tried to implement it over there there's the charming judge <laughs> there's the charming courtroom and there's the charming private <laughs> Lost, are you still Ladies and gentlemen, don't draw any inference from this. <laughs> <laughs> we lost, we we lost the doc. Lost doc, are you there? I think I'm back. I'm back. <laughs> He's on my screen, Judge. The Zoom link's still open. I see him on this Can screen. Can you hear me? Yeah, we see you. We just don't have you on the big screen yet. <laughs> ah, that's the solution. Scratch one screen. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to understand, I may kid with you at times. This is very serious, yes, and it's due to respect, but sometimes it helps when things don't go right to have a, a little smile put on our faces, so bear with me on that. Now we've lost everything. There's the doc back. <coughs> Okay, I still got private on the screen. Uh-oh, he's going into the closet. The control center's back there, guys, okay? That's it, we'll do Wizard of Oz. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Off the record. Did you get all that wonderful humor for the Court of Appeals? <laughs> Patience, Doc. We'll be there in a second. That's fine. <laughs> Is it on that screen there, the doc? It's on my computer, Jack. It's not on. The I understand. Computer. It's on the screen on the on the docket thing no. now. We could just share the Zoom link. Yeah, they got all their computers up there to join with us on their phones. Yeah, that's all I need. It'll send the system into an overload. Paul's actually the best. Yes. I know. It. There we are. Yay. Thank you, Paul. Okay, so we don't have to worry about a doc for now. Stay here, Bob. Take a minute. Join us for a minute and help us. Mr. Zion. Thank you. By stipulation of the parties, 320F, the part shown to you by Mr. Baez. Dina, I wanted to copy you as well. Since pharmacy is concerned, 
that the nursing staff is overriding Pixis to obtain and administer these medications. I will keep you updated on the progress and send you an optional invitation to this meeting. Thank you. Okay, that's what that says. Do you recall that being shown to you in your cross-examination? Yes, I do. Do you recall the question of Mr. Baez? Sounds like there's a problem in pharmacy. Do you recall that question? Uh, yes. In fact, doesn't it sound like there's a problem in nursing staff? Yes, it did. All right. Mr. Baez asked you about diversion, also known as just stealing drugs. Do you recall that? Yes. All right, I'm gonna ask you if, if somebody can lower that blind behind you there. <laughs> diversion. You're shining. <laughs> Was there any evidence of diversion in this case that you found? No, it was discussed and, and, and considered, but there was no evidence of that. All right. Doctor, can they close that blind behind you? Uh, we're doing it as you speak, Judge. I mean, you look very angelic up there, but... <laughs> I think that may be the first time anyone's ever said that. Well, it's the first time you testify with a blind in the background, or the sun, actually. True. Gonna, there we go. That makes it That's all right. That's all right. Okay, Mr. Zion. There was questions about what action you took initially with Dr. Husel. Do you recall testifying on direct? You took him off the schedule. Yes. Do you recall Mr. Baez characterizing that as putting him on leave? Yes. Are those two things the same thing? I don't know. I've never really seen a definition of on leave and how it would compare to being off the schedule. Well, you were placed on leave. Yes. You were told to come, so, go home and not come back, right? Yes. Is that the same thing you did officially with Dr. Husel after your, uh, on, in December with your initial actions with him? I believe it was. All right. Do you recall the question, equally trained doctors and equally experienced doctors can have different opinions, correct? Yes. Let's run through the doctors and experience they have, if you know, of the people you talk to about the dosing habits of Dr. William Fusel in the nighttime ICU regarding ventilative withdrawals. Objection. Okay, we're going to have to have a sidebar on this one because I know where it's going. So, ladies and gentlemen, get to know each other some more. You guys, I know you guys have gotten possessory about your spots. But you might want to switch up and get to meet somebody new. Just a thought. No one's going to give up their spot. I already know that, right? Thank <laughs> you. 
Mr. Zion. Let's talk about the doctors that you talked to in your investigation of Dr. Husel's dosing habits during palliative extubation in the nighttime ICU. Do you recall, ten, well, well, who was the first doctor you talked to? And Dr. Gina Moody. Who? Dr. Gina Moody. Okay. I know she was the first person you talked to about this. Did you talk to her particularly about these doses? Yes, I did. Okay. Objection. I'll permit it. All right. So after your conversation with Dr. Moody, were your concerns ameliorated? No. All right. Who was the next doctor you talked to? Dr. Anthony Dominic. And remind the jury what Dr. Anthony Dominic does for a living. He is an anesthesiologist. And what is his role at Mount Carmel? In addition to practicing anesthesiology, he is the chairman of the Department of Anesthesiology. And after speaking with Dr. Dominic, were your concerns ameliorated? Objection. He's not a critical care slash. Okay, you've made your record on it. I'll note the objection of a rule. No, they were not. Who was the next doctor you talked to? Dr. David Ralston. And remind the jury what David, Dr. David Ralston does at Mount Carmel. He's a critical care physician who also served as the uh, medical director of the ICU. And after your conversation with Dr. David Ralston, were your concerns about the dosing habits of William Cusel during palliative extubations in the night at the ICU, were your concerns thereafter ameliorated? Objection. I note the objection overruled. No. You had a second, did you have a second conversation thereafter with uh, Dr. Dominic again? I did. Okay, I have a roll. Yes. About the dosing habits of William Husel during palliative excavations? Yes. Did your investigation stop because you were now satisfied there were no concerns? No. Who did you talk to next? Dr. Santa Emma. And remind the jury what Dr. Santa Emma does. Not he's, the, he's the medical director of the palliative care um, department. And after your conversation with Dr. Santa Emma about the dosing habits of William Husel during palliative extubations in the nighttime ICU, were your concerns addressed and your investigation stopped? Uh, no. <clears throat> To your knowledge, was Gina Moody had only been a doctor, had Gina Moody only been a doctor for five years? Objection, Judge. I don't right. believe so. Okay, stop. I'm sorry. Stop. Senior. I'm sorry. Rephrase the question. Do you know how long Gina Moody had been a doctor? I don't remember currently. Was she a brand new doctor in Mount Carmel? Objection. No. Let's put it in a time frame. Had she practiced more than five years? No, no, no. When you're at when at what point in time are you asking for? Are you oh. asking in 2018? Yeah, oh I apologize. Yes, in 2018. She was not new at that point, no. What about Dr. Ralston? No, what about, he was not new then either. What about Dr. Dominic? No, he was not new then either. What about Dr. Santana? No. 
and I believe you testified that this was, in fact, though, Mr. or Dr. William Hussle's first job. Leading? It is leading, sustained. Was this Dr. William Hussle's first job as a, out of medical school, out of, out of training? Yes. Mr. Baez asked how many times you talked to the prosecutor. Do you recall that line of questioning? Yes. Do you recall him asking, have I ever spoken to you? Yes. To your knowledge, has Mr. Baez ever asked to speak with the objection? Sustained. Let's. All right. There was quite a bit of talk about. Well, let's, let's stop for a second. Ladies and gentlemen, we were going through voir dire. Mr. Baez doesn't have to do anything. He's got no burden here. The burden's on the state of Ohio. So any reference there is improper. He doesn't have an obligation to do anything. I wasn't trying to imply he did, Judge. Well, I gave the appearance that, and I just wanted to avoid that potential problem. The burden is on the state of Ohio, not 100%. on the defense. A hundred percent. But I think there was an implication that he, he couldn't talk to him, and that's was my only point. Well, that infers that he would have to. Well, then I apologize that it wasn't improper if that was the inference. I apologize. The burden is on the state 100 percent. May I move on? You may. Greg Peterson, Premier Criminal Defense Attorney in Columbus, Ohio, I, I think is how Mr. Baez described him. Do you remember that conversation? Yes. Did you hire Greg Peterson? Personally, no. Did the hospital hire Greg Peterson, to your knowledge? I'm not sure who hired him. Was he hired by the hospital at some point? Or the health system, I believe. Okay, that's what I meant, by the corporation, whoever. So are you aware that Mr. Peterson also works in the area of health? Leading. Yeah, let's rephrase. Are you aware of other areas of law that Mr. Peterson uh, works in? No, I am not. All right. Let's talk about the villain document. Do you recall that document? I'm sorry, the billing document? Villain. Okay. Villain. Bad guy. V I L L I I N. Villain. Villain. Yes, I do. Is that yes, in I front do. of you? Excuse me? Is that in front of you? Yes, it is. All right. Does that appear to be a Mount Carmel document on letterhead or otherwise indicated to be a document from Mount Carmel? It does not have letterhead. Does it, it have any no indication that it is from Mount Carmel, an internal Mount Carmel and document? No, it does not. All right. Objection, Judge. May we approach? Yes, we may. <laughs> Guys, I'll talk to you in a minute. Favor? Is he running out of things to talk to you about? Oh, my God. <laughs> Baby, you got to get more interesting. <laughs> I won't let him juggle for you, so that's how the routine goes. <laughs> He's under injury care. <laughs> Tell him how to make baklava. No, just make it for Oh, Skyline has 
Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Mr. Zahn, do you want us to repeat the last question, or do you know what it was? Um, I uh, let's repeat it. Oh. <laughs> Okay. Yes, I'd like to repeat. Evidently, you have somebody speaking for you. Okay. So, so Mr. Baez, you would like I to repeat? I apologize. Call the balls and strikes. <laughs> repeat the question, then, Madam Court Reporter. Actually, Judge, I think there was a clarification. There is, but I was trying to get us back to where we were before, and you wanted me to repeat the question. So I'm going to give you that what you asked for. Yes, Your Honor, and with uh, the court's permission, just to summarize this and to move on uh, in a leading way. So, Dr. Swanner, does that fact that it doesn't have Mount Carmel things on it corroborate your memory? Object to corroborate? Well, that was the point. Okay. I'll permit that part of it. I haven't heard. Uh, why don't you finish the question? That that was from an outside consulting firm that was later not used. Yes. So, one more on this. It was part of Mount Carmel documents, but an outside entity prepared, prepared that, to your memory. I, I believe so. Okay. On direct and on cross, you were asked about uh, who and uh, who you reported to, um, do you recall the agencies that you self-reported to? I believe so, yes. And can you list those again so that we can get back there? Because there was one you were asked about on cross I'd like to talk to you about. CMS. What's CMS? The Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services. It's the government entity that administers Medicare. Who else? State Board of Nursing. Who else? State Board of Pharmacy. Who else? The, um, I don't know if we reported to the Board of Medicine, but we did report to the um, National Practitioner Data Bank regarding Dr. Husel. And this was all voluntary and self-reporting, meaning you did it on your own? Well, Mount Carmel did it on their own. I didn't make any of these reports personally. That's, that, that's what I meant. As an organization, you did that? Yes. Right. Yes. So the Department of Justice, you recall the questions regarding the Department of Justice? Yes. That was in one of those media consultant game plan things? Do you recall That's that? correct. Yes. Oh my goodness. It was on page 10 of this document. Uh, and I believe, and I'm not even going to try this jazz again. Um, this is what she asked about, right? It's page 10. That's, can I just read that to him to get back to where we're at? Question. This is in, this is on page 10. Uh, situation overview, updated 12, 29, 18, that document. Okay. Okay, you got to page 10 there? Yes. Uh, Q, does that stand for question? I would assume so. All right, and the question being, do you plan to self-report to the Department of Justice? 
Yes. What's, the, what's be written below that? Objection. Following up with. Objection. Hold on, there's an objection. Council objected to its being admitted, so. I don't okay, know. Okay, well. Okay. Let's rephrase, because I know why. Let's rephrase it. What is MCH integrity slash compliance? That's just what I'm trying to get at. Mount Carmel Health System, Department of Integrity and Compliance. All right. It's a part of Mount Carmel Health System. Does, does this document indicate that there needed to be follow up with that part of Mount Carmel Health Systems? Yes. All right. And you're not sure if the hospital self-reported to Department of Justice? No, I don't know. All right. But you are sure those other five agencies, they did self-report to? Yes. Do you recall, Mr. Baez, uh, I'm sorry, do you recall being asked on cross-examination uh, regarding your dismissal from Mount Carmel employment and Dr. Husel's dismissal from Mount Carmel? Do you recall yes. that line of questions? Yes, I do. Do you recall being asked, you were treated just like Dr. Husel? Objection, that wasn't the question. It's not exactly the question, yes, but it's the subject matter. So let's rephrase. Do you recall that line of questioning? Yes. Do you recall? Uh, do you recall saying you had you had, you actually talked to Dr. Husel prior to his being placed on leave? Yes. All right. And then being asked. So that's the only difference between you and Dr. Husel. Objection. I mischaracterized it. Okay, that he knows of? Is that your question, that he knows that's the I'm only difference? Just directing his attention so I can ask my question, Judge. Just getting him back there. Okay, I'll overrule it for now, but let's tie it up. All right. The only difference between you and Dr. Husel. Objection, Judge. Again, that mischaracterizes the question. Overruled. Did you give any patients 500 micrograms of fentanyl? He brought it up, Judge. He said that's no, the only this difference. Is the yeah, that's not issue. My okay. Sorry, guys. Business. Oh, don't roll your eyes at me. Come on. <laughs> give me a little bit of loving on this one.
Yep. Referring back to the differences, the only difference between you and Dr. Houston. Were there other differences in your situation and your termination and Dr. Husel's termination? Objections. I believe so. And what were those? They were given a reason at all for any poor performance, expectations that were wrong, or any other would justify my training for as. Okay, you're to totally school. breaking up. Slow down. Doc, stop. Okay, let's let the okay. machine refresh itself. Do you remember the question? I do. Okay, you can answer now because all we were getting was gerbil, gerbil, gerbil. Okay, sorry about that. I was not given any specific reason of poor performance or expectations that were not met that justified my termination as an explanation at all. Whereas I know in Dr. Husel's suspension from the medical staff, there was a reason given regarding excessive, I don't remember the exact wording, but it had to do with and don't tell uh, prescribed the, okay, I do, okay. Okay. There was a reason given for his suspension, which is different than mine. Okay. Anything else? And did those reasons... Objection, Judge. The court ruled on this. Okay. I haven't heard the question yet. And did those reasons relate to Dr. Husel's medical practices? Same objection. Noted. Overruled. Yes. Thank you. I have no further questions. Thank you, doctor, for your testimony. I hope your surgery goes well if you have it. Okay, you're excused. Thank you. Do you have your next witness ready? We do. Call it. Doctor, uh, Your Honor, the state of Ohio calls Dr. Daniel Roth to the state. Live witness. What? It's a lot. Shut down the thing, so maybe it'll work better. Back off to the witness. Okay. We're on the record? I got it. Why are you messing with my red dot? Okay. What do I need to do, Paul? Come up here and show me. Left hand. Yes. It just has arrows and X. Okay. Now, Paul and I are discussing the, this system again, and I'm starting to grovel or at him to please bring the other one here. But I know that it's an impossibility. Okay, can we bring us back up to where we were? David, go ahead and swear him. You swear or affirm to tell the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help me God. Thank you. Uh, please be seated. Make yourself comfortable. And if you would be so kind as to state your name for the record and spell your name, please. My name is Dan Roth, D-A-N-R-O-T-H. Everyone here? Okay. Mr. Zion? Thank you. Sir, can you please tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury what it is you do for a living? Uh, by background, I'm a primary care physician, but today I serve as an executive uh, with the health system, Trinity Health. All right. Well, then let's talk about your background. Where did you go to college? 
I went to college at Michigan State University. And what year did you graduate? In 1991. Did you go to any school after Michigan State University? I went to medical school at the University of Michigan. And what year did you graduate medical school? I graduated in 1995. And so what degree did you get from medical school? Get a medical doctorate. Okay, so you're an MD? I am. All right. What administrative did you receive after medical school? So after medical school, I did a residency in internal medicine, also at the University of Michigan. That lasted for three years. We've heard several other doctors say they were uh, had, had specialties in internal medicine. Could you describe that a little bit to the ladies and gentlemen of the jury, what that involves, what that typical practice might be? So in general, internal medicine is a, is a medical specialty that focuses on the medical problems that adults face. So it doesn't have surgical problems, as an example, but more okay, of the... hold on. I'm sorry. Stop. Stop me out a bit, okay? These people are having a problem hearing them, and, you know, being from Michigan, you're used to a lot of hot air and stuff. <laughs> this is Buckeye territory, sorry. I know you're probably already aware of that. Uh, but enunciate a little bit louder, because these people over here are straining to hear. Okay? Absolutely. And you're in a bubble anyway, so it's tough. So if, as long as you stay towards that mic, okay, you're yep. usually pretty good. Okay. Okay? Absolutely. Mr. Zion, I'm sorry for interrupting, but I can see these guys about ready to fall out of their chair. Thank you, Chad. I'm going to stand back here. Hold on, just one second. Sorry. So internal medicine is a specialty uh, within healthcare for the medical problems of adults. So we don't, internists don't do surgery by way of example, but deal with a broad range of health problems as adults. So it's also not pediatrics. It is also the, the ordinary basis upon which then people go on to do future or further training called a fellowship in things like cardiology or pulmonary or gastroenterology. All of those are subspecialties of internal medicine. Did you practice as a doctor uh, specializing in internal medicine after you obtained that specialization? Yes, after I finished my residency and, and I did one extra year um, as a chief resident, I practiced internal medicine and private practice in Cincinnati, Ohio for about eight years. And are you board certified in internal medicine? I am. And are you licensed to practice medicine in the state of Ohio? I am. Are you licensed to practice medicine in any other state? I am not. Okay. So eight years in Cincinnati. Um, was that affiliated with a hospital or did you have a practice where uh, people would come to your office or both? So uh, I had a practice where people would come to our office. We did see our patients when they were in the hospital, so we would go if our patients ended up in the hospital, we would see them there as well. But primarily we were in, in our own office and people came to see us there. All right. As you said you did that for eight years. What years were those, if you recall? 1999 until 2007. All right. Thereafter, uh, you left that. What did you do next? Uh, I took a role uh, with a local health system, actually the hospital where I practiced every day, as a vice president of medical affairs. I started that in 2007. Can you tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury what type of things you did as a vice president of medical affairs at that Cincinnati hospital? Absolutely. We worked on things like uh, efforts we could do to improve quality uh, and safety of care, how we could make care more efficient, uh, how we can work together between physicians and nurses and, and others to make sure that we are uh, making care more coordinated for people uh, in the various aspects and departments of a hospital. Can you explain, by way of example, some of the things that this would involve? So, uh, by way of example, uh, we did a project where we uh, looked to identify people who were going to get sicker and need the ICU before we would recognize them so we could get them to the ICU faster. And so those are the types of things we do to try to improve quality and safety by trying new and, and innovative things to um, 
to identify patients to make it easier for physicians, nurses, um, and to improve safety, as an example. And when you're in this role at that hospital, are you still practicing with patients, have a, have a clinical practice at this point? At that particular point of time, I was working as a hospitalist. So we also had a hospitalist program within that hospital, and I was responsible for that, and I worked clinically occasionally as a hospitalist. At some point, did you leave that job? I did. What was the next job that you had? The, the next job I had, I served as the chief medical information officer for the health system, which was called Catholic Health Partners, uh, which that hospital was a part of. And what did you do in that role? Uh, in that role, I worked on how do we use technology to improve care and to make it easier for clinicians and caregivers. So things like electronic health records and how do we use electronic health records to improve care and safety. All right. And so this is still in Cincinnati? It is. What did you, at some point, did you leave that job? I did. What did you do next? Uh, I, I served as the president of our medical group. So we had a, a medical group of physicians in practice in a variety of specialties within that same health system. And I served as the president of that medical group. And what did you do in that? So in that role, we, we similarly, we worked to, this was more in medical practices, so it was more outpatient predominantly, but how do we make sure in those practices, similarly, we're, we're being accessible, right? We're growing and uh, trying to provide care to people when they want it, how they want it. At some point, are you still working as a hospitalist? Or are you still doing any other type of clinical care at this point? At that point in time, I did work a half day a week as a primary care physician in one of our practices. It was a half day a week at that point in time. And what point in time is this? This is from 2011 through 2015. Right. At some point, did you leave that job? I did. Where did you go next? Uh, I moved to a health system that is based in Michigan, which is called Trinity Health. Can you describe Trinity Health to the ladies and gentlemen of the jury about its, what it is, its size, et cetera? Yep. So Trinity Health System is a faith-based health system that um, really is on a national basis. So we have health systems uh, across the country in different states, including like Mount Carmel here in Columbus. And, and so we have hospitals and care delivery systems, senior communities uh, in about 22 states across the country uh, delivering health care. And what is your role with Trinity? What, what is the title of your position? And then explain to the folks what you do there. So today, I serve as the chief clinical officer at Trinity Health. I've served in that role since 2017. Or, yeah, 2017. Prior to that, what did you get hired into? So I got hired at Trinity Health in 2015 to work in our population health department. In that department, we really work on how do we do care models that can look at patients holistically 365 days a year, so not just in a hospitalization or in an office visit, but how do we provide care for people that really meets their needs every day to improve quality, lower cost, and improve their experience. And so that was what I was originally hired in to work on those care models uh, at Trinity Health. And in 2015, are you still doing any type of clinical, seeing any patients? I, I have not seen patients since 2015. All right, so at Trinity, that's when it completely ends your clinical practice completely ends. That is correct. All right, after uh, you do this job uh, that you just described, did you do something else? Well, I, I moved into that chief clinical officer role I mentioned a minute ago. Mm -hmm. Starting in 2017, I'm still in that role today. All right. And what do you do as a chief clinical officer? So I'm a member of the executive leadership team that really is responsible for clinical care delivery within our health system. So it is making sure that our strategy encompasses the key parts of a clinical uh, aspect, as well as making sure that the aspects of our clinical enterprise across the care continuum are meeting our, our goals and needs, uh, like improving quality, safety, access to care. That's my role, is how to make sure those pieces are really working together to deliver on that. Can you give us some examples of some initiatives that, might, that you might do or have done so 
folks can relate to what you're saying there as your day-to-day -day job. Yep. So a couple of things that we do or have done uh, would include, so we have this notion of, um, I mentioned how do we deliver these models, right, to make it easier for people. So we have what are called accountable care organizations that are national, where we're then responsible for caring for, you know, 100, 150,000 people. And we then continually improve the care model to try to make sure people have access to care, that their care is coordinated. And so we've developed a system to coordinate people's care, to keep them well, to keep them healthy. When you say coordinate people's care, meaning between different providers? Yeah, one of the hard parts of healthcare is that sometimes people have a hard time moving from, from the hospital to home or in between specialists, and so our care coordination is designed to make that easier for people. So the doctors can all talk and know what's going on, for instance? Yes. All right. And when you in this role in October of 2018? I was in this role in October of 2018, yes. And you mentioned you're, you work for a corporation or a hospital uh, group called Trinity. Yes. And you said it was nationwide. That's correct. Can you explain to the ladies and gentlemen of the jury what, if any, relationship there is between Trinity Healthcare and Mount Carmel uh, Healthcare? So, a large part of Trinity Health is made up of regional health systems. There's about 15 of them. One of them is Mount Carmel Health System here in Columbus. And so we're, that is predominantly what we do. We have other services we offer outside of those regions as well, but predominantly, so Mount Carmel is one of those regions. It's a wholly owned part of Trinity Health. All right, and I think we've heard the term that, uh, and said you're, you're Mount Carmel's parent. That would be a, one way of describing it. All right. And has its parent company, do you have any responsibilities for the things that go on at Mount Carmel? Yes, I am responsible for the, all of the clinical issues that happen within Mount Carmel. Right. When you say clinical issues, you mean patient care? Patient care, yep. All right. So if there is an issue of patient care at Mount Carmel, <coughs> that would fall under your purview? Yes, ultimately. So, with that being your purview, at some point in either October or November of 2018, were you informed of an issue going on with a physician in the ICU in the night at Mount Carmel West Hospital in Columbus, Ohio? I was first informed about an issue in the ICU at Mount Carmel West uh, on November 30th. November 30th, all right. What, if anything, were you told on November 30th, and how was this communicated to you? So I was told that one of the members of my team, who works in Michigan, had received a call from one of their colleagues who works here at Mount Carmel, that they had identified a number of... Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I assume you're offering for what he did. That's correct, Chair. Okay. As to the truth underlying the statements, that's a different issue, different person, okay? You're getting this information because he's telling you why he did certain things, okay? Now, you may say, but Judge, that don't make sense to me, okay? Judge explain why he did what he did, okay? You guys will get other evidence to determine other facts, okay? So you can't take it as a true, but as to why he did. Does that kind of make sense? I'm trying to summarize about two semesters of law school here, okay? Think of it this way. You're getting the why, okay? You're not getting the what. Does that make sense? Okay. For purposes of, your invet of what you did, what were you informed about? I was told that there were a handful of patients at that time that had received doses of fentanyl uh, around 1,000 micrograms during a palliative ventilator withdrawal. All right. What, if anything, was concerning about this report to you? There were a few things that were concerning about it. One, I agree, he's not qualified to make an opinion. 
let's rephrase the question. I'll give you a little bit of leading on this since it is kind of a delicate issue. Sure. You're a licensed medical doctor? I am. Okay, let's, no, let's stop. Ladies and gentlemen, make yourself busy.
now he's ran away. <laughs> no, you can. I don't care. Is everyone ready? Yeah, I'm ready. That's the big one. Thank you, sir. <coughs> Sam? Okay. I'm not moving fast enough? No, I was just making sure your court okay. was ready, sir. In your role as chief clinical officer, when you found out about the dosing habits of Dr. Fusel, were you concerned? I was. And based upon those concerns, what did you do next? I called Ed Lamb, who it was at the time the chief executive officer for Mount Karma Health System. What happened next? So he and I had a conversation about what they were doing next to understand the circumstances behind this and how the I and the system office could help the Mount Carmel team. What happened next? So uh, that was a Friday. Um, <coughs> Was that the day you received this first initial phone call? Yes, still, call? still, still November 30th. So that was a Friday. What happened next? Uh, so I had a touch base with Ed, and we talked about the progress on their work on Monday and Tuesday, uh, and then we had a larger conversation about what the next steps would be on Wednesday, which would be, I think, December 5th. All right. When you say a larger conversation, do you mean a, a more wide-ranging conversation with just Ed Lamb, or do you mean more people are brought into the conversation? It was both a longer conversation with more people involved. What, if anything, are you doing to further your investigation at this point besides talking to Ed Lamb and other people about this on that next Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday? So at that point in time, the investigation was being led by the team here at Mount Carmel Health System. So I was not directly involved in the investigation outside of hearing what they were learning through their investigation. What happened next? Uh, so the decision was made uh, to uh, pursue a, a summary suspension of Dr. Hussle's privileges uh, because of a concern of safety. Uh, Can you explain as, that? Yeah, so physicians have privileges through the medical staff. They provide them the, they, the oversight and responsibility for exercising their clinical practice within a hospital. There's a provision which says if there's a, if there's a concern about safety, uh, that the physician's privileges can be put on hold or suspended pending an investigation in the interest of safety. Who's safety? Safety of patients. <laughs> And when, if ever, was the suspension put into effect? I believe it was, it was that week, I believe it was that Tuesday, which would have been the 4th. December 4th of 2018? Yeah. Did you task, or did you have, are you aware that Dr. Swanner was tasked with delivering that letter to Dr. Husel regarding the suspension of privileges? I believe that is correct. All right. What happened next? Uh, so the next day, there was this conversation uh, went into what our responsibilities were to notify other agencies and par uh, parties outside of Trinity Health, or outside of Mount Carmel, that we were learning about, yeah, what we had learned. So that included um, things like the state medical board or uh, legal and law enforcement authorities. 
the state pharmacy board. So that was the conversation that also, as we were continuing an ongoing investigation. At this point, when you're having this conversation, at the state medical board, the pharmacy board, or other regulatory or law enforcement approached Mount Carmel or Trinity about anything they had heard about the dosing habits of Dr. William Hussle during palliative excavations at night? They had not, to my knowledge. All right. So at this point, it is an investigation and a situation contained within Mount Carmel and or Trinity? Up until that point. Do you have an obligation uh, to report issues like this to those boards? Um, we have an obligation for any time we identify significant or what are called sentinel events to notify and, or breaches in people's uh, professional licenses. I believe we have an obligation to notify. You said something before the word, something events. What was that? Sentinel events. Events that are rare and unusual. Okay. What happened next? Well, at this point in time, there are a number of things that are happening concurrently. Talk about the number of things that are happening concurrently. So these entail continuing an investigation to understand how many patients were impacted by this, to understand the medical facts in the cases uh, where this seemed to occur, uh, to understand the underlying reasons uh, and uh, participation about why safety processes didn't work, as well as to begin to think about how we would communicate this to patients. I'm sorry, to, to family members. Right, the patients have actually died. To the patient's family members. Okay. What happens either next or concurrently or simultaneously in this process to your member? Uh, so concurrently, um, well, for one, the, the Mount Carmel team had a meeting with the Franklin County Prosecutor's Office to inform them of what they had learned to that point in time. Around the same time, the decision was made to, to terminate Dr. Hussle's employment contract with Mount Carmel, uh, and we continued to do a number of uh, investigation, broadening the investigation to understand how many people were impacted. All right, let's talk about the meeting with the Franklin County Prosecutor's Office, Mr. Ronald Bryan, the former prosecutor. Do you recall if there was an attorney involved in setting that meeting up? To, yeah, there was an attorney who was involved named uh, Greg Peterson. Peterson, thank you. All right. Okay. Did you hire Greg Peterson? I did not hire Greg Peterson. But Greg Peter Watson was hired either by Mount Carmel or Trinity or somebody associated with that for this purpose? Uh, Greg Peterson was hired by Mount Carmel. All right. And if you know, why particularly Greg Peterson? I do not know why particularly Greg Peterson. Was there a concern about Mount Carmel and or its officers and or its parent company being charged criminally themselves as an organization? That was not a concern that was prominent. I think the biggest reason for hiring Greg Peterson was knowing that there might be an ongoing investigation from a legal or criminal perspective that was gonna run in parallel with our investigation and we don't have familiarity with that, and so we were looking for Greg to assist us in understanding that space so that we didn't uh, unintentionally uh, impact that process. When you say you didn't have familiarity with that space, meaning the criminal world. That's correct. All right, what about the attorneys that Mount Carmel either has on staff and or on retainer? Are they criminal defense attorneys or people that are familiar with the criminal litigation world? They are not. What is their familiarity, if you know, in general? I think they are experts in healthcare law and in business law. So you need an expert in this area? Yes. All right. So, I understand things are, many things are happening concurrently. Let's talk about one of those things, the meeting with Ron O'Brien. Do you recall that meeting? Can you be more specific as to which meeting? The first meeting, the first time you had contact or you were aware of anybody from Mount Carmel or Trinity had contact with Mr. O'Brien and or anyone with law enforcement. 
So I believe that meeting was also on December 5th or 6th. I was not present at that meeting. All right. Were representatives from Mount Carmel and or Trinity present at that meeting? Uh, representatives from Mount Carmel were present at that meeting, yes. I believe we heard Dr. Larry Swanner say he was present at that meeting. Does that sound right to you? That sounds right. All right. What happened next? Um, over the course of the next few weeks, uh, that investigation process unfolded, as well as our trying to understand the, the system processes that we need to redesign to ensure safety, and we continued to work toward the path to communicate um, what we had learned with patients' family members. And this is what you did at your, your, your prior two jobs, looking at systems from the point of view of delivering better health care to safe care patients. That's correct. So that's why Dr. Daniel Wallace found the mission. Yeah, and also there was a lot of, it's a broad scope, so just also to add assistance um, as a complement to the team here at Mount Carmel. As part of that investigation, did you identify any system failures with the FIXIS system and or pharmacy and how things are approved uh, through that system, through the software and or through the system that was set up? So, we identified that there were uh, deviations from the known best practices and safest practices for medication ordering, dispensing, and administration that were common in these cases and common in the ICU at Mount Carmel. Did you contact at some point or in this time period the pharmacy board regarding these deficiencies? We did. One of the things that we were committed to early in this process was to be transparent. Jackson Judge, unresponsive. I think it is. I disagree. I will rule. Go ahead. Was to be transparent with external agencies and authorities, and so one of those was the, the Board of Pharmacy, and yes, we contacted them. So that we're clear, and this was described as a self-report by Dr. Swanner, would you characterize this as well as a self-report situation to the Board of Pharmacy? Yes, I would. So you weren't actively being investigated by the board or Mount Carmel and its system weren't actively being investigated by, by uh, the pharmacy board until you voluntarily contacted them. To my knowledge, that is correct. For one of those system failures uh, in examining what's going on in pharmacies, was there a concern about drug diversion or drug theft by people either at the pharmacy and or nurses and or doctors? So early in that process, one of the things that was considered was that there was that one of the things that could have been happening was drug diversion, which is to say that these medications weren't actually be giving, being given to the patients, um, but were being diverted um, for other uses. So that was one of the things that was considered early on. All right. Was that uh, possibility, one of those, was that possibility fully explored uh, throughout your investigation? It was, it was, it was fully explored. And based on your knowledge of the, that fully explored investigation, did you or anyone to your knowledge find any evidence that these drugs were being, that there was drug, a widespread drug diversion problem? No, we found no evidence of drug diversion. Was there any evidence at all in your investigation which would indicate in any way that the patients of Dr. Husel were not administered the drugs that are indicated in the medical records. No, we found no evidence to that effect. Taking you back to December 5th, there's a meeting that you're aware of, you're not part of. What happens next? Um, so, as far as I know, then there was interviews by the Columbus Police Department detectives of some of the nurses and I believe pharmacists involved in some of these cases uh, later that week. That same week? That same week. You say detectives. Do you know what division these detectives were from? These detectives I've subsequently learned were from the cold case division. The cold case homicide division? Yes, that is correct. Thank <laughs> you.
We've heard that these voice reports and the internal, internal uh, safety concerns voiced by pharmacists and others, the investigation, the peer review is kept on a confidential nature until resolved if something needs to be talked about. Is that your understanding? That is my understanding. So with that understanding, would you have any reason to believe that the nurses and pharmacists and others involved in the dosing habits of Dr. Husel when he does palliative excavations at night would have any idea they're about to be interviewed by the murder police? I don't, I don't know the answer to that question. I, I don't think they would. Objection, Judge. Okay. Uh, I would move to strike, and I would ask. Let's strike the answer. Be admonished for that. Admonished for what? I think. Sustained. New question. Are you aware whether or not Mount Carmel, under these circumstances, of your personnel about to talk to homicide detectives, hired or had availed <coughs> an attorney to advise them of their rights. They did. And why did you have an attorney available to advise nurses and pharmacists of their rights prior to talking to homicide detectives? We thought that was in the best interest and would serve the, the, the uh, put our colleagues, we call our employees colleagues, put them in the, make sure they had all the information they needed since they came into this as part of their work. All right. And do you know the name of that attorney? That attorney was Greg Slummer. Right. Was Greg Slummer hired for any other reason to your knowledge? Not to my knowledge. So this is all that same December 5th week that the police, the homicide detectives, are talking to your employees. What happens next? So there are a number, again, so there are a number of things happening. And so the investigation continues to try to understand how many patients, and by the end of the month, we have identified 27 patients. Um, and uh, we uh, have a second conversation with the Franklin County Prosecutor's Office because we are preparing to talk to the family members, as I mentioned earlier, uh, and want to make sure we're doing that in a coordinated way. And we're continuing to try to understand the processes we need to put in place to make sure that uh, we reduce the chances of errors like this happening again. All right. Before we move on to that meeting, that second meeting that representatives are having with the county prosecutor, uh, is HR, I mean, meaning anyone from human resources and or safety uh, department, talking to the same people that the uh, homicide detectives are talking to? Yes, they are. Do you know if they are talking to them before or after the police? My recollection was there was a desire to um, coordinate that, and so we waited until after the detectives could talk to the colleagues first uh, as much as possible. Why are you conducting a concurrent investigation through HR and safety at the same time as the Homicide Division of Columbus Police Cold Case Squad is conducting their investigation? Our investigation really is focused around safety. Uh, and making sure that we're addressing safety issues within our health system. That's what we do. The, the Franklin County Prosecutor and the Columbus Police Department are doing a criminal investigation. That's something that, that they do. How many hospitals in Mount Carmel? There are four. Do you know how many people are employed there? About 9,000 people. Do you know how many doctors are employed there of those 9,000? Well, there are about 2,300 doctors and the medical staff. They're not all employed, but they are on, have privileges to practice at our hospitals. Can you shut down those four hospitals and those patients that are being cared for by those 9,000 people and 2,300 doctors while the police conduct their investigation? We cannot. So you have to keep going? Yes. 
Do you feel it's your obligation during that process to get to the root of this, to make sure your patients are being cared for safely during that investigation? Okay, I lost the second part of your question because you turned around. Sorry, Judge. Did you catch the question, Sam? Yes. Can you read it back to me? Question, do you feel it's, <clears throat> it's your obligation during that process to get to the root to make sure your patients are being cared for safely during that investigation? Again, please. Do you feel it's your obligation during that process to get to the root to make sure your patients are being cared for safely during that investigation? I permit the question overruled. Did you hear the question, Doctor? I did, John. Go ahead. Yes, that is our responsibility. All right. So what about this second meeting with the county prosecutor? When did that happen? And to your memory, who was there? So it was around the third week of December, if memory serves. And um, I was there, the general counsel for um, Mount Carmel was there, the executive accountable for communications at Mount Carmel was there, and I believe Greg Peterson was there. And then I believe Ron O'Brien and uh, Jimmy Lowe uh, were there from Franklin County Prosecutor's Office. All right. What happened next? But the, the, purpose, the main purpose of that conversation was to make sure that as we proceeded to unresponsive. I'll let him answer, go ahead. The purpose of the meeting was to make sure Judge, that Judge, the question was what happened next? I think he's question. Okay, let's redo the question so So we can move on to what happened next. Thank you. What was the purpose of the meeting? The purpose of the meeting was to um, make sure, as we prepared to talk to family members, we did not want to do that in a way that would interfere with their work. So we wanted to be clear about the timing with which we would do that and make sure that they did not have any concerns about that. All right. Why at this point do you want to talk to family members about the dosing habits of Dr. William Hussle during palliative extubations? in the nighttime I see you. Yes, Judge. Let's go sidebar. I see we're gonna have a series of these, so let's just take it now. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, entertain yourselves, please.
Have the question up there. Well, when we get when you get set up, I'm going to have you read it to the jury again so they can understand what the question was. You do your voodoo. I'm good with it. Read back the question, please. Question. All right. Why at this point do you want to talk to family members about the dosing habits of Dr. William Fiesel during palliative excavations in the nighttime ICU? Okay. Do you understand the question, Doctor? I do. Go ahead and answer. So we have a responsibility to talk to family members. Uh, or to patients when care doesn't go the way that was intended to go, or that they receive. Judge, judge, he's stated an opinion. No, he's not. I overruled. So we have, we have, and so that is why we told, we felt the need to tell family members about what we had learned and what we were doing to understand it more fully. Was it was a plan developed? Uh, to do this, or was it just you picked up the phone and started calling? No, a, a plan was developed to do this. All right. Do you know what that plan was? Generally speaking, yes. What was that plan, generally speaking? The, the plan was to have a number of physicians and other clinicians at Mount Carmel reach out to the family members and explain to them what we had learned so far and what we were doing. And how many family uh, families or patients had been identified that you believe needed to be contacted at this point? I believe the number was 27. This is in December of 2018? At the end of December. All right. Was it ever discussed in an internal memorandum what would be said by these various clinicians who would be calling the family members? Yes. How was that? Can you explain more? Your he question? wants to know how was that done? If you know, let, let me be more specific. Yeah, let you could. To direct your attention to what's been referred to as Project Lighthouse. First of all, do you know what Project Lighthouse is? Yes. And what is Project Lighthouse? Project Lighthouse is the term that we became, we came to use for to understand for this investigation. All right. And do you know who named Project Lighthouse? I do not. All right. But you recognize that's the name for this investigation? Yes. And within Project Lighthouse, uh, are you aware whether or not any scripts were developed uh, to give these doctors to read? Yes. And why were scripts developed? 
a number of reasons why. This is a, a really hard conversation for to have with family members. These are family members whose loved ones passed away and sometimes years before. And so we are, we are in some ways sort of bringing that back for them. And we wanted very much to do that in a way that was factual and sensitive to that. Uh, as well as consistent. And so we wanted to be thoughtful about that and give those clinicians and physicians who are making those calls some of that information at hand so we can make sure we achieve that goal. Do you know if there was more than one person involved in developing the precise language that would be used in, the, in these scripts? I believe there was more than one person, but I do not know the exact number. Do you know if uh, these uh, scripts were reviewed by clinicians before being approved? I believe they were. Do you know if these scripts were uh, reviewed by lawyers for the hospital besides Greg Peterson before they were uh, uh, finalized? I don't recall. All right. Do you know if uh, anybody from media or a consulting firm was reviewing these scripts? I do not recall if, if they were. All right. Do you know if there was more than one version of these scripts? I do know there, were, there was more than one version. All right. And when we have different versions, does that mean all of them are used or just the final one used? Just the final one would typically be used. All right. So you're, you're, you don't recall who all reviewed it, but you re recall there was more than one person reviewing it, and this was refined? Yes. All right. So particularly to something that was discussed earlier, do you know whether or not a woman named Katie Barja, a safety officer at Mount Carmel Hospital, do you know who that is? I do. And do you know whether or not she conducted what's called a root cause analysis? Uh, yes, I, she did conduct a root cause analysis. And do you recall when the conclusions of that root cause analysis uh, were uh, finalized? I believe that was in December of 2018. It may have been early, 20, early January of 2019, but I believe it was December of 2018. All right. And do you know whether or not the script that was being developed to talk to these families was changed as a result of Katie Barge's root cause analysis? Not to my knowledge, I did not know that. Do you know Katie Barge's report and she's a safety officer, right? Correct. Is she a clinician? I don't know the I believe she's a nurse, but I don't know that for certain. All right. Without her, yeah, if she has nursing as a background, do you know if she's like a nurse out on the floor doing that, or does she do something else for us? Now she's the patient safety risk officer, so that is her role. Okay. And she would have been the author of those root cause analysis. She would have been led the team that developed that root cause analysis. So based on your experience in dealing with issues like this, had you ever experienced anything like this, having to reach out to people about something like this before? Objection, Judge Relevance. Well, it's a compound question, but you change gears, Mary Stream. Let's do it again. Do you have any, do you have, any have you had any prior experience in a situation like this? Objection. Uh, a situation like this meaning disclosing to family members? Yeah. Okay. So, no, I've been part of teams and have disclosed um, to family members when care did not go the way that we expected it to before in other circumstances. All right. And was there ever a situation where it was discussed what would be said to the family members prior? Yes. To reaching out to them? And were different versions of what should be said to the family members? Should have asked an answer. I'm talking about in this prior experience. I'll permit it. Go ahead. Note the objection. Were words changed? Were words refined? Um, yes, words were changed and words were refined okay. in advance. All right. Would you call this a common uh, thing in your area of work? Yes. So you had this meeting in December with Mr. O'Brien and others from the hospital and from the prosecutor's office and the police. Uh, 
You thereafter, thereafter was, uh, did you guys start contacting the family members? Yes, sir. we contacted the family members on December 27th and December 28th of 2018, I believe. All right. Did you in any way dictate to Mr. Ron O'Brien, to Mr. James Love, to Detective William Gillette, to Detective Dana Ch Chambers, to Detective Ann Pennington, what they were going to do in their criminal investigation and what Mr. Ron O'Brien was going to do in his criminal prosecution? No. Were you asking for their guidance in what you should be doing so as not to interfere with that investigation? Yeah, I think it was, I don't know that I would call it guidance. We were, we were looking so as to not interfere. So I guess to that extent, yes, that was our goal, was to not interfere with their investigation. And after that meeting, you start, you, me, people at Mount, the clinicians at Mount Carmel that have been talked about, start making phone calls. Yes. All right, using the script? Yes. All right, what happens next? Um, so we, we continue the investigation to understand the scope of it. Over the course of the, the next few weeks, we interview you know, more people to try to understand some of those, uh, and then we begin to implement some of the practices we need to put in place to minimize the chances that errors like this could happen again. Okay, basis. Subsequent remedial measures. Any response? No response. Sure. Sustained. Mm -hmm. Well, hold on, folks. Let's take a let's end for the day. I think there's a couple things I have to discuss with the jurors. Okay. Okay. Doctor, just hang tight there. Okay. Sure. I'm very security conscious, and I just got notified. There are currently, I think, three other trials going on in the building. There is supposed to be a protest tomorrow morning at 8.30 outside the courthouse. All the indications it's gonna be peaceful, but it could interfere with you guys getting in, okay? Um, if you have questions about your alternative entries and stuff, I think Mr. Pettix will be more than glad to answer them for you. Okay, there are several ways to get to the building, the tunnel and other things. It depends upon where you park and other things. I don't, all the indications are it's going to be peaceful, but you can't assume anything like that, okay? Uh, so I wanted to put you all on notice. It may be difficult getting in here tomorrow. You may want to consider an alternate entry, okay? The second thing. I know that plexiglass has been a problem for you all, okay? I have been working very hard with the administrative judge to try to get it released. My colleagues want to wait until the, I believe it's the 17th, when the judge's meeting is, to vote on the whole order. So I won't be able to fix that until that occurs. We have an administrative order. We're in a communal courtroom here. This isn't my normal courtroom, okay? We're using it because of the size and all the lawyers and everything else. We're using the bigger room because we needed the space, okay? So I'm bound by that order. And I've tried to get a change so that I could deal with it. I appreciate your patience on the issue. I'm trying to do something about it. I at least got rid of the front class. So, and I almost pulled off that second row, but didn't work out, okay? Um, so we're working on that, okay? I know it gets difficult to hear with the plexiglass around here and everything. You guys had problems hearing me sometimes. So I'm trying to work at that, okay? But I'm gonna be, I'm a realist too, and I'm gonna tell you, it may have to wait if I can't politic in the back hall for the next couple days. Uh, to get it any earlier. So I'm trying on that, okay? Um, I'm going to let you guys go now. It's five minutes early, but I figured if some of you have questions for David, you'll need to ask them.
Okay. Anything else from the parties? No, Your Honor. Not from the state. Thank you. Not from the defense. Okay. Any questions on the protest? Yes, sir. What about media? Uh, media out there? Yeah. I don't have any control over them. I can only control them in here. Okay. Your Honor, okay. It, the protest it makes it seem like it's about this case. No, no. It's about Judge Young's case. Okay. Okay? It had, like I said, there are other trials going on in the room. It has nothing to do with this case. 